Hello, church family. Um, I would like to share this um, these two verses from um, Psalm chapter 5 with you this morning. Um, they're verses 11 and 12, and they say, But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy, and may you shelter in them, or shelter them. And may those who love your name or that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. So as we worship today, um, let's just remember that the Lord is our refuge.
Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Of course, I uh, am hypothetically speaking. I don't see anybody but our camera and my faithful son-in-law, Jason. But uh, just a quick announcement to you. I uh, wanted to bring you up to date on when church is going to start. I would ask you to pray. We're working together with some of the other churches to uh, start together and we want to do what God would call us to do so uh, my prayer request for you is that you would pray that we'd be able to start services very soon uh, if we do probably the first one would be an outside service I want to encourage you I spoke on this on Wednesday's uh, devotional so you might go to the Wednesday study there on our web page so encourage you to reach out to someone as well to be praying for somebody uh, within the body and just uh, kind of communicate the love of Jesus to other people one of the complaints and not that we complain but it was kind of a good complaint I thought somebody appreciates my humor and their complaint before we go into Revelation chapter 22 as you get your Bibles out uh, I did hear a story that somewhat ties into today we're to be looking forward to the Lord's return we're to be ready for his return we're to be ready to go to heaven but I heard this and I thought I would share it with you and it's not really that good it's kind of a tough situation but the story goes the uh, lady was talking to her friend and said, what do you want to do for the future? And she said, well, I want to get married four times. And her friend in shock said, wait a minute, four times? Uh, what would you get married four times? Why would you get married four times? And, and she said, well, the first time I, I want to get married <laughs> to a banker. And yeah. And secondly, I want to get married to a Hollywood star. And thirdly, I want to marry a clergy type person, a pastor. And fourth, believe it or not, I'd like to marry an undertaker. And her friend looked at her in shock and, and said, is there a reason for this? And her response was, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready and four to go. And I share that with you today. And sad part is nobody in here laughed but uh, that's okay maybe you laughed at home but we want to be ready to go I think that was the one thing I would encourage you as we look at Revelation chapter 22 we've looked at chapter 21 what that city's going to be like what the walls and the foundation and we went into that in chapter 21 but today we look at chapter 22 and to me, God is giving us some real insight. If you were to go on a trip, and hopefully you're going to go on one from this world to go home to be with Jesus when he comes for his church, or if God takes you home, that you would have some kind of insight to what it's going to be like. And, you know, if you're going to travel somewhere, go on a trip, you go and you get a brochure from the travel agency and you look at the pictures. Oh, I want to see this and I want to go there. Well, that's what the Word of God's doing for us. It's saying someday we're going to be in God's kingdom. So this morning we look at verses 1 through 5 to, to get a glimpse of what it's going to be like inside the city, the New Jerusalem. And then we go into God's final exhortations there in the book of Revelation chapter 22. So join me, if you would, in prayer as we get excited to look at God's words this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for the hope we have. Thank you for the love you've displayed. I pray for each one of us that would be listening to this message. Lord God, that we would not lose a heart for the gospel that we would not forget the cross. We would not forget what you've done for us and that you, Jesus, would always be the center of our life. Lord, I pray that we would glean from this teaching, that we would be challenged, Lord, to be vessels of honor for your kingdom, your glory, 
that others through us might get a glimpse of the salvation, the love that you displayed on the cross and that we might lead others to the truth of your word. So strengthen us, encourage us, comfort us, Lord, give us peace through this time that we gather together to grow in our relationship with you, to grow in the knowledge of your word. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister the truth of your word, that you would give us understanding to it. And Lord God, that we would be bold witnesses in these last days for your kingdom and your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hopefully you've turned to Revelation chapter 22, the final chapter there in the canon of Scripture, the truth of God's Word. And, and it's God's desire, I believe, as we go into this chapter, that we would be confident in our final destination. So we kind of looked at what the exterior would be in chapter 21, and now in chapter 25 or 22, we look at the first five verses and see the, the final call to those who would read this book, those who would respond to God's call to turn from sin and receive his forgiveness. So let's dig in. I'd like to just read the first five verses, and then we'll dig into that, and then look at uh, some of the other things that we find in this chapter. And Jesus took John, or the Lord took him and this angel, and showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I read that, and the purity of heaven is going to be not defiled. You may remember what we looked at there in verse 27 of chapter 21. It said, but there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So now John gets a glimpse of inside the city. He sees this pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And you say, well, why is it always the throne of God and the Lamb? And I personally believe God is speaking through his word. Don't forget the cross. Don't forget what Christ has done. And something that grieves my heart as we've studied this book is that pastors and churches and believers don't go into the book of Revelation. And we're going to find out that God gives direct insight to the importance of the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation does what? It reveals the glory of Jesus Christ. It reveals the truth of God's word. So look what he goes on to say there. Proceeding from the throne in the middle of its street. Now we look back, that street was that of pure gold in chapter 21, verse 21. And we see also that there in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves were of the tree, of the tree were for the healing of the nations. We don't quite know or understand what that healing means, but I believe it means just the fullness of God's kingdom. And then it goes on in verse 3, and there shall be no more curse. And I like that. You go back to the book of Genesis and you look at chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. That was the curse that came upon man because they violated the word of God. There's consequences to violating the word of God. And we're going to see that in the closing of the book of Revelation as well. We're not to add to or take away from his word. And then we see that in verse 4, it says... That, well, let's go back to verse 3, that God and his servants, uh, we are going to be serving. Those that are in God's kingdom shall be serving God. We're going to be serving the king of kings, but also we look at the New Testament. We go back, and it speaks also that the Lord's going to serve us. It's going to be this, this serving of one another, because really, that's where joy is. I want to challenge you when you serve other people. When you serve God, when you love people, there's great joy in that because it's being honoring to the Lord because he is our example 
and he served us, he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. And then it goes on, it says there in verse 4, they shall see his face, his servants shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. We're going to see God. We're going to be in a place we could see God. No man has seen God other than Christ when he was revealed here on earth, all God and all man. But it says we're going to see him. We're going to be in our new bodies, our glorified bodies. And recently I know those that have gone home to be with the Lord. And as you come to the end of your life, you realize, boy, a new body, a living hope. And to go home with, to be with Jesus is such a glorified thing. So we see there that we're going to be known as God's children. And then note verse 5, there shall be no night, there no need nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So the light of the world, Jesus Christ is going to be that light, and he's going to be what we look forward to there in heaven, that things are going to be different. Things are going to be glorious beyond anything you and I can even comprehend. Verse 6, then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Why would he say that? John is overwhelmed, I believe, seeing heaven, seeing all the things that God has created and the blessing that God has given. But he says, I want you to know this is the truth. And isn't that something you and I as believers, when Christ changes your life, you can say, this is the truth. I go back in my own life when I came to the Lord way back in August of 1976. God changed my life. Jesus Christ changes life. The word of God is faithful. The word of God is true. And we should have a passion to share that word with those that are lost. And he also said that in chapter 21, look what he said again. He said in God, speaking of what heaven and our relationship with God's going to be, John again said it back in chapter 21, verse 4 and 5. He said, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And here it is. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God wants us to trust in his word. God wants us to be challenged by his word, that we would believe the word of God. We would be looking forward to the return of our king and we'd be living in a way that we're ready for his return. So we pick it up then that these words are faithful and true. John now says that. And then he says, The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. So it's going to happen. And I looked that up because I thought, well, shortly, it's been 2,000 years so since John said those things. And then in verse 7, Jesus comes on the scene and he speaks to John. He said, Behold, I'm coming quickly. And I, I looked that up, and literally it means when it happens, it's going to be quick. It's going to be as a thief in the night. It's going to be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to be a time where we hear a voice and the Lord says, I'm coming, get ready. If you're not ready now, you're in a dangerous place because the Lord is giving warning three different times in this chapter. The words, Behold, I'm coming quickly. It's going to happen quick. And Christ is going to take his church home to be with him. So behold, I'm coming quickly. Jesus now speaks in verse 7. And he says, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Something's going to happen here in this chapter that I really want to bring note to. There are those who avoid the book of Revelation. There's those who avoid the whole counsel of God. There's those who are not obedient to the word of God and not teaching this book. And because it's very clear in chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord says there's a blessing for those who read, hear, and obey the words of this book, of this prophecy. 
And then we see here God reiterating that in his word. He's saying, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. You want to get a blessing? Stay in the word of God. Read the book of Revelation. Allow the revelation, the glory of Jesus Christ to be part of your life. This book is all about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords coming for his church coming in his glory and the warning to the seven churches there historically, but also that warning to you and I, we need to be ready. We need to be looking. We need to be watching. We need to be praying. And God in his grace in this chapter does so many things. He warns us. He says, I'm coming. It's going to happen quick. When it happens, it's going to be just, and it's over. We'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know the day nor the hour. We know the season. I believe according to the word of God, it's very clear we're living in that season today. So look what he goes on. John says, now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now, we're not to worship anything other than the Lord. You may remember back in Matthew chapter 4. Verses 8 to 10, when Christ went through the temptation, when Satan tempted him, Jesus quoted scripture and he said, you're to worship the Lord and him only shall you serve. The reality of it is worship is something that is given to the Lord. And John, probably just overwhelmed, fell down. But look what the angel responded. The angel in verse 9 said, then he said to me, John says that, he said, see that you do not do that, for I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. And then he said, what? Worship God. There's a lot of men today that are in pulpits that desire the worship of the people, the adoration and the praise of the people. In fact, there's many denominations that actually the leaders strive to have the titles of reverend and most reverend and most very reverend and all of these man-given titles. I love the teaching I received from Pastor Chuck and I reference that often because it was good, sound doctrine. There's none reverend, no, not one, only the Lord Jesus Christ. And here the word of God tells us, worship him. We're to be in that place that we worship God and seek his counsel through his word. So in verse 10 it says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Many people, I believe, miss that verse. What does it say? Different from the book of Daniel that the prophecy of this book was to be sealed, no, it says in Revelation chapter 22, we just read it, it says, worship God, but do not seal, do not seal, verse 10, the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. What's God saying? I want the book of Revelation read to the church. I want the book of Revelation taught to the church. And as it begins with blessing to those who read it, those who hear it, those who apply it or obey it in their life, there's great blessing. And now God again says, hey, don't, don't limit my word. In fact, he's even going to go to the point at the end of chapter 22. He says, don't add to or take away from my word. Paul said that. Paul in the book of Acts said those words. He said, listen, I've not failed. I've not held back. I've taught you the whole counsel of God's word. And I think that's that's so important to us. So we're not to seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And I, th I think, wow, look at what's happening today. Who would have thought something would happen where churches would be closed? Who would have thought that over the world, all over the world, this pandemic would take place? And I believe, as many other pastors, I believe this is a wake-up call for the church. I believe God is pouring out his grace, and I see the grace of God in this final chapter. Anybody that maybe just reads the final chapter of Revelation, they see so many things that God's serious about his word. 
God's serious about Jesus Christ being the one who's lifted up and worshiped. God's serious that we would not add to or take away from his book. The church today needs to stay true to the word of God. We need to be men of God, women of God that share the word of God with others. And he's even going to close with that gospel that he who's thirsty, let him come. But look what he goes on to say in verse 11. It says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. What's God saying there? Man has a choice. I love one of my pastor friends that is always shared, and I hold fast to the same truth. God puts no one in hell. Man chooses to reject the truth of the gospel. Man chooses to spend his destiny because he wants nothing to do with God or Jesus Christ. We're living in a time today that the lines have been drawn. The killing of the unborn, the sanctity of marriage literally defiled of what God designed. And men aren't even bold enough to speak the truth of God's word. And we need to be bold enough to share the truth of the word of God in love. And that's what revelation. But God is saying in that verse, hey, if this is where you want to live, live there. He's giving you and I the freedom of choice. He's saying, let those that desire filthiness pursue it. God reaches a place that he gives you and I the freedom. I believe he does knock at the door of our hearts. I believe he does give us opportunity to repent. I believe he does come before us with opportunity to realize through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's time. It's time to walk with Jesus. It's time to live for the Lord. Look what he goes on to say. He says in verse 12, and, and now he repeats it a second time. And Jesus speaking these words says, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. What we do for the Lord will not go without a blessing. If you're serving God and you're doing it for his glory and you love the Lord and, and it isn't for the praise and adoration of man, it isn't to be recognized, if you're serving God and doing it for him because you love him, there's going to be great reward. I don't know what that reward could be, but God will be roared. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think, wow, what a blessing that is that God would be there, his reward is with him, to give to everyone according to his work. And you say, well, wait a minute, does that apply to salvation? No, salvation solely by the grace of God. It's the gift that God gives to his creation. But you've got to put your trust in Christ. You've got to turn from your sin with a true heart of repentance. But once you come to Christ, the Bible says we're his workmanship, created for good works. Jesus again says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. And I love what he says. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And I think, wow, we serve a God. If you're a believer today, you serve a God that is the creator. Jesus Christ created everything that was created. And he is the beginning. He is the end. And he's the one that is coming the first and the last verse 14 says blessed and so we see that again we go back up in verse 7 jesus said blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book and now john is writing blessed are those who do his commandments and wasn't that the heart of john he speaks about that in first john he took the words of jesus if you love me Keep my commandments. And obedience is an act of love towards God. But John writes these words and he says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now what's God doing here? This is really interesting. Uh, John is now saying as believers, as 
people as followers of God, there's going to be a blessing to our obedience. But he's also going to say that reward is the tree of life. That means forever and ever, everlasting life with the Lord. So he, he's speaking the gospel here. And he's saying those who have obeyed God and loved God and kept his commandments are going to receive of the tree of life and enter the city. Speaking of heaven, a lot of people think, well, I'm a good person. I'm going to go to heaven. Well, listen to what the scripture said. Those that obey the word of God are going to be those that have the right to the tree of life, that they can enter through the gates into the city. But look at the warning in verse 15. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves the practice or whoever loves and practices a lie. God's serious about the truth. He's serious about his word. I don't want to discourage those of you that are dog owners that you say, oh my gosh, my dog's not going to get in. They're outside. Well, we don't know. We know there's going to be animals in God's kingdom. We're going to be returning on horses. And, and we don't know all the details, but that word dogs there literally means despised scavengers wasn't like people had their pet dogs. These were the ones that were rab rabid dogs that would, would just be disgusting. They were despised. They were scavengers. They would, would attack things. So he's saying those that are in that place, those that are despised because of their immorality, because of their sorcery, and that word sorcery or sorcerers is where we get our word pharmacy, pharmakita. Uh, pharmacia, the drugs that are rampant. Uh, what did I hear the other day? One of the major chains that was trying to hire people, like only 5% or 10% could even pass the drug test. We're a society that's addicted with all the legal drugs that uh, we've now, and God's saying, listen, don't have things control you. Let the Word of God control you. Let the Holy Spirit control you and I hope I'm speaking to some of you today that you would trust God that you would find contentment in him not through alcohol and drugs and trying to numb your senses God wants our senses to be pleasing unto him but the sexual immoral and the murders and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie that goes back to what John says we all fall short we all have sin we all battle our sin nature, but the Word of God's pretty clear. When you make it a practice, when it's your lifestyle to be in violation to the Word of God, there's a danger. You'll be outside the gates. God's saying that. And then Jesus, in verse 16, says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Note that this book is for the church. This book was written to the churches. This book was written for you and I to be challenged to live in such a way we're motivated to live a life that's godly and pleasing before the living God. See, revelation motivates me to say someday there's a heaven. Someday I'm going to be there with the Lord. There's going to be a reward for those who faithfully serve God. And let me just tell you, I get to see things that many people don't see being in ministry, but get to see the hand of God. Get to see when God puts different people on your heart and you call them and it's right at the moment they needed somebody to pray with them. That we get to see God work in that sensitivity that God would give us to share the gospel with other people. We need to be faithful in that. And I shared on Wednesday's teaching, I shared God wants us to have input through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit, that we would be used by God serving God. That we would also have that outflow that God would bless us with his joy and his peace. But Jesus said, I've sent my angel to testify to you these things. The book of Revelation, 
or to be things that are taught to the church that we're to live in that expectancy. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. What happens today if through this message, through the word of God, you're challenged in such a way to hear the word of God that you respond to it. You begin to live for the Lord realizing it's time. It's time to walk with Jesus. It's time to not be in a place you practice sin. It's time to live for the Lord and serve him. And let me just give you great encouragement. You can't do it in your own strength. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as believers, we need to say, Lord, strengthen me through your spirit. Fill me afresh each day with your Holy Spirit that I might live in a way that pleases you. But Jesus said, I've sent these things to you that you might know. It's to the church. And then he reiterates who he is. He says, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The root means he is deity. He's the very beginning of all things. He's the one we've created in his image, the scripture tells us. And then the offspring of David, just as it was prophesied, the Messiah would be of the offspring of David. He's all God. He became all man and came to this earth in the flesh, born in a manger, lived for 33, 33 and a half years, served the Father, was obedient to the will of his Father, and he went to the cross for you and I. And I love what it says. He's also not only the root, not only his deity, but the offspring of David as prophesied in the scripture out of the lineage of David would come the Messiah. And then the bright and morning star, what's that mean? He's the light in heaven also means he's the light of the world. Jesus brought the light of God into the darkness of the world that man, through putting their faith in Christ, putting their faith in Jesus Christ, the light of the world, would receive the forgiveness of their sin, that they could receive that grace that God provides only through the cross. That's why you read Revelation, and it's all about the Lamb. It's the Lamb of God, as John said, who takes away the sin of the world. The cross is never to be forgotten. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. When we break of bread and take of the cup, it's in remembrance of Christ. I encourage you. Is your home with your family, you dads, you fathers, you heads of your home, get the bread, get the cup, get into the word of God and lead your family in a place of remembrance of what Christ did on the cross for you through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection. So he comes to that place and again the gospel wouldn't it be sad if the word of God didn't close with the opportunity for people to come to Christ? We as a ministry here believe it's important every time we meet on Sunday morning, first service, second service, that we're sharing the gospel. Because if one person comes into the church that doesn't know Christ, don't they deserve an opportunity to receive him as their savior through the work of Christ and the cross? Jesus said, don't forget the cross. And look at verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I think salvation is made very clear. And yet so many people work for their salvation. So many people think, well, if I do this and I live this way, no, it, it's, it says that living water that Jesus spoke of. He who's thirsty, let him take that, but you've got to take it. See, you could have water in front of you, and it could quench your thirst. But if you never drink it, you never take it internally, there's no benefit to it. You might be today a person that knows the Word of God, knows the Bible, knows all that the Bible says, but if you haven't allowed it to enter your innermost being, that you would be an individual, that the word of God is having an effect on your daily life, and other people see that. I think of some of the books that have been written that people have shared their testimony 
What a glorious thing that they're able to share. Jesus Christ delivered me from addiction. Jesus Christ delivered me from the life I was ready to take my own life. And Jesus Christ spoke hope into my heart. Because there is a future, there is a hope with the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the key. If God in his word is challenging you and I to share the gospel, which Jesus gave the great commission, and now we see it. It says, let the church, the spirit, the bride, we're the bride of Christ. We're to be telling people, come through the power of the spirit, come to Christ. He'll fill that emptiness. He'll take a broken heart. He'll heal all of the, the wicked, evil things in your past, and he will forgive you. We as the church need to share that message. That's what the Bible say in verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. That's you and I, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I think about the challenge that God would give you and I, that we have the word of God. The question is, are we sharing the urgency of the return of Christ, that Jesus is coming? And then the Lord shares the importance. And I see the church today thinking they've got to come up with something better than God's word. I see in many cases the word of God is no longer the priority of the church. And yet God says, I want my word to go forth. I want my word and the truth of my word to go forth from Genesis to Revelation. And we are challenged to be obedient to the word of God. And the church today in many cases is left the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to share the good news. The purpose of the church is to exalt and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to be a place of refuge. It's a place that people can come together. People have asked me, what do you miss about most at the church? I'll tell you what I miss most is you, the people, the fellowship, the love that is displayed in this building as we learn the word of God and we go out and I hear how God through his word is touching your life and other people's lives. Don't we want to see revival? I do. I lived through the Jesus movement in the 70s. I saw how the word of God transformed people's lives, took people out of the pit of hell the way they were living, and gave them hope and gave them a new life. Don't you want to see revival? It starts with you and I. It starts with you and I having a hunger for God and his word, a desire to be blessed by obeying the word of God. But God's serious about his word. Look what he says in verse 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. I think, do pastors realize that today? Do you and I as believers realize how serious God is about his word being taught? His word being shared, his word being lived, that we are, according to the word of God, if you're a believer today, you're an ambassador for Christ, you represent the living God. I have a desire within my own life, Lord, help me not to stumble somebody. Help me not to live in a way that stumbles other people. I want to walk in that place of humility, always directing people to Jesus. It's him we serve. It's him who gave us salvation. And the bottom line is, God would challenge us through this book that I need to be prepared for his return. Peter speaks of that. Peter challenges us in a great way. There at the very end of, of 2 Peter chapter 2, he says these words. He speaks of the coming of the Lord. He wants us, God wants us ready for his return. Return Jesus there in the Olivet Discourse 
spoke the same things, that we would be ready for his return. But listen to what Peter wrote. This is found, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But here's the warning. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Behold, Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. It's going to happen quick. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, this is it, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And the Holy Spirit, as Peter writes, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blemish, being blameless before God, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Paul's saying, listen, God's delayed is coming, and maybe that's for you today. Maybe that's for you hearing this message that Jesus is coming, and I believe it's a season of his grace. I believe we see death rampant. We see all of this going on. We see the scripture literally being fulfilled. And we hear that over and over, and have we become dull of hearing? Or do we sit and listen to the word of God and say, God, speak to my heart, strengthen my walk with you. Lord, help me to be a bold witness for your kingdom in the words that I say and the life that I live, that others might see Christ in me that I might do what's right, that I might live in a way that I display compassion to those that are lost. We gotta have the outflow in our life. We gotta be people that share our faith. We gotta realize that we're to be those that share the truth of God's word. God will change the heart, but we'll never see revival if we're not bold in living in a way that others see Christ instead of see a church that's filled with all kinds of darkness all kinds of hypocrisy, all kinds of people that profess Christianity but don't even know who Jesus is, don't even know what the Word of God says. The challenge to you and I in the book of Revelation is to be ready. The purpose is to provide motivation for you and I to live in a godly way. That's what the Word of God tells us. God will take away it says, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And then again, he who testifies to these things, the Lord Jesus Christ, says, surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And then isn't it incredible, the last verse in chapter 22, the last verse in the Bible John writes these words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So be it. We need to get back to sharing the grace of God with a lost world. We need to get back to share the truth of God's word and that unmerited favor that God can do no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter how far you've gone from the living God, God says to you, my grace is available. The time's running out. We don't know the date or the hour, but Jesus said when it happens, when it happens, it's going to happen quickly. And we're going to be out of here. And what kind of legacy have we given to those we work with? Family members, friends, have we spoke the truth to them in love? Are we bold witnesses in a time that we see the world going crazy without God? And yet you and I know the truth. May the book of Revelation, as we read it, I challenge you, go back through it. Read the whole book again. Study the book. 
you're going to be blessed in doing that. Know that it's all about the revealing of Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals him in his glory. The first time he came was to suffer on the cross. The suffering servant to shed his blood and pay the price for you on the cross for your sin and mine. But the second coming is in his glory. But even though he comes in his glory, the scars will be there in his hands, in his feet, in his side from the cross. Because may you and I never forget the cost of our salvation. And it's because of the grace of God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can't be a good person to obtain it. Salvation solely comes through the grace that God provides through sending his son to die on the cross. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this season we're in. It'll be exciting when this season comes to an end. When we're reunited back in the fellowship that you desire for your church. When we come together to realize the church isn't the building, it's the people. And Lord, when your body gets to come back, when we get to see each other and, and talk to one another and fellowship with one another, how glorious is that going to be to tell of all the things you did to restore maybe broken homes, to restore families, to restore, Lord, maybe those that have left you, that you've brought them back. You're the God of restoration. And I pray that you, through this time, would work in the hearts of your people, that we would serve you, walk with you, live for you, be sharing the truth in love with those that are lost and not compromise your word. We read this morning, we're not to add to it or take away from it. We're not to compromise the truth of your word. But man has a problem and it's sin, and maybe that's you today. If you die in your sin without repenting and coming to Christ, you'll live in eternity in a place of judgment. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you turn from that sin and say, Lord God, would you forgive me, help me to live for you, walk with you, and this day I put my trust in what you, Jesus, did on the cross. And I want to receive the gift of salvation because of your grace. Come into my life. Come into my innermost being. Fill my heart with your truth and your love for me. And Lord, let me recognize the forgiveness you provided through the cross. Oh, Lord God, help us to go as a church forward with the message of the gospel. That we might see great revival in these last days. And Lord, we want to close this morning praying for our leaders. That Lord God, there's so many of them that are deceived and led astray. And there's so many that are living for you, interceding in prayer for this nation. So Lord, be with our leaders. Those that don't know you, we pray that you would use those that do to draw others to the cross. Help us to not abandon the truth of your word. Lord, help us to share the words of the book of the prophecy of the book of Revelation with others. Yes, Jesus is coming. Yes, there will be a final season of great judgment upon this earth. And if you don't know Christ, you're in a place of eternity apart from the living God. Give us boldness to share the truth in love. And Lord God, that we would be students of your word, that we wouldn't add to it or take away from it. It's the whole counsel of you, the living God. We thank you for your word. Work in our hearts, we pray. Help us to share the love of Jesus with those that are lost and see you work in their hearts through your Holy Spirit. Work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and I so look forward to actually looking out in the worship center and seeing you here. May we reach out to others, pray for others, pick up the phone, call somebody, reach out and pray with somebody, and be blessed to be a vessel that would serve God in these last days. God bless you. Jesus Christ.
today. Thank you for your word. May it dwell richly in our hearts, we pray, throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.